Hello and welcome back to the What The Fog preview podcast ahead of the midweek visit to Preston North End. It was a well-earned but slightly dull draw at the weekend as the lads were able to battle for a valiant point of QPR and were on the road again this week as we head to Deepdale. And when we play Preston, there's only ever one man that I actually allow on the show, making his 45th appearance. Uh, it's Preston fan and journalist Tom. Tom, I feel like we've stayed in touch anyway, but let's pretend we haven't. How are we doing? You all right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'll apologise in advance in case there is a dog barking at any point because there are fireworks going off everywhere. Um, but yeah, I, I'm doing well. Good. Nice to hear, mate. We'll yeah. get stuck in, you know, straight away. But as standard, there's always going to be loads to speak about because it's the championship. Um, but 3-1 defeat at home to Bristol City. It sounds pretty crap. It probably was. So how was the performance? Yeah, you nailed it, really. Um, yeah. it, I mean, I think well, there's going to be games like that in the championship. I mean, Preston North End versus Bristol City is probably the most championship fixture that has ever happened and will continue to happen until the end of time. Uh, I think part of the frustration, especially, I mean, for myself, is that North End rested players for Arsenal in the week, rested first team players for the cup game, and in you know looking ahead to Saturday against Bristol City, as mentioned, was going to happen at any point in any season. Um, and then you go out and you don't even get that result. It kind of stings a bit more that they didn't really go for it as much as they probably could have done against Arsenal. Uh, but yeah, it was just a poor performance all round, really. North End managed to get themselves back in it at, in the second half. And then almost as soon as they got themselves level, they go behind. I mean, there's a huge, huge slice of misfortune with the first goal, which has now gone relatively viral for the fact that the hmm. striker slaps it away from the goalkeeper as he's coming to claim it. Um, but, you know, it's one of them, you're going to get poor decisions. It just so happens that that's blatantly obvious. It's the same as if someone gets pulled down and the referee says play on and stuff like that. It just always looks a bit more insulting when it's such a blatant handball. Uh, but yeah, North End didn't really deserve to get anything from the game. Um, and it, it's another one of those occasions you'll kind of look at and go, this shows kind of the job that, that Paul Heckingbottom has got on his hands at the moment. It's interesting. I was watching Ref Watch, uh, Ref Watch today and like they brought it up and they were like, oh, so thoughts, Dermot, handball? Yeah. <laughs> Move on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, did have, I did have a little bit of sympathy for the, the referee um, because the angle he had, there was a kind of a couple of bodies and it didn't look massively, massively obvious necessarily from his angle, potentially at full speed. Then you see, obviously, the reaction of Freddie Woodman and, you know, you're never going to go off just the reaction, but those sorts of things can say a lot sometimes. And obviously, the replay showed it was just <laughs> blatantly slapped out of his way. Same referee as the one from the Mexico 1986 quarterfinal between England and Argentina, <laughs> apparently. Um, but you touched on the result itself. Look, it, it is a poor result. I don't think many people would see Bristol City, no offence to them, at, at home as a, a game you'd want to lose by a two-goal margin. But it's now the third game, if we're including the Arsenal game, where you've conceded three in a row. I think it's 11 in the last four games. And my mathematics, which I'm not very good at, says that's an average of 2.75 per game over the last four games, which is uh, not exactly mental levels of mathematics. But before that one, you kept four clean sheets in five, which is probably the most interesting aspect of it. Why have the past few weeks been more goals being conceded and... Um, you know, less scored, really. Yeah, I think there's a bit of new manager bounce in there. I think they, they've got, you know, a different voice, different ideas, and the team's being stretched a little bit more. You know, there's gaps in the squad. There's, you know, the, the transfer policy over the summer coming into this season looked a bit questionable, more so when you obviously have to change manager after a game and there's transfers kind of still going on whilst that new manager is coming in and he's not able, only really able to make one signing. Um, and that's Josh Boland. He's hardly going to keep the ball out of the net. So it's one of those, I think, a little bit of poor form around the defence, but you look at the likes of Kane Kessler-Hayden, who I think is an absolutely fantastic player, someone North End have been crying out for as a fullback for a long time and it will play higher than, than where North End are at the moment. A little bit of poor form, maybe, along the defence. Potentially a bit of tiredness. There's not a great deal of scope to rotate. But I think you also get added pressure from the fact that you can't score at the moment. So North End obviously are missing pretty much all the strikers. Emil Reese is kind of the only recognised first team striker. Leighton Stewart at the moment struggling for game time. 
uh, on the bench, but has had very limited first team experience. So if you can't score at the other end, if you can't give the opposition something to, th something to think about and apply pressure at the other end, it's only going to come one way. And then it becomes a harder task for the defence. I don't think, you know, again, talk about a fresh voice, perhaps this defence needs freshening up. It's, they've been fantastic servants for North End for a long time, these players, likes of Jordan Story and Andrew Hughes, Liam Lindsay. Um, even Freddie Woodman's only been here a couple of years, but he's done a good job. Maybe it's time to freshen things up. Just a bit of poor form, though, on the whole, because, you know, Andrew Hughes is a fantastic defender. Liam Lindsay's been in the Scotland squad recently, and, and Jordan Story's a, a capable championship defender as well. I think you you might have been the first, or you're at least one of the first. I should have researched this, but I couldn't be bothered um, to sack the manager this season. Um, well, that's the thing. So they didn't sack the manager. So that's something that can be misreported at times as well. It depends ah. who, who is saying it. Uh, yeah, so Ryan Lowe was not sacked. Ryan Lowe... Uh, left of his own accord which is kind of another reason why there's a bit of sympathy towards North End in that one game in if the manager just throws a towel in you, you're kind of up against it a little bit but um, yeah it wasn't it wasn't something that North End were planning to do and they're not the type to do knee-jerk decisions when it comes to manager sackings I mean five defeats to end last season is probably enough to have sacked Ryan Lowe but they stood by him um, and for that they got one game out of him so Low by name, low by nature. <laughs> um, I felt like we discussed though an awful lot in like previous podcasts last season and the season before, Preston and Ryan Low, and I don't know why. Whenever I chatted to you, whenever I chatted to any Preston fan or, or looked online at the, the forums of the media, it just always felt like the relationship wasn't quite quite right, and and I can't explain it. I don't know what it was. I'd always ask you about it, and you'd say, "Well, you said these things, and this is a bit fractured," but then, and it just seemed like. Not even a love hate relationship, like it, it just like two Lego pieces that don't really fit, and you kept trying to put them together. Um, it snapped obviously, and, and as it is, I thought he was sacked, he's, he's left. But why did it end when it did? Like, why why just get up and leave after one game? It's a, it's a kind of a weird time to go, isn't it? Yeah, so Ryan Lowe basically said that he felt something was off, went with his gut. There's a piece out in uh, might be the Telegraph today, I think. Um, have been basically explaining the decision a little bit more, uh, a bit of PR really, um, saying he's ready for a new job and all this sort of stuff, before overperforming for North End and where teams mm -hmm. should have been finishing depending on their budget and Plymouth's lowly budget when it wasn't lowly really because he told us so that it wasn't. It was the, it was the fourth highest in League One when um, Schumacher won the league and he kept telling us that that they weren't over overachieving at the time. Um but yeah, so he said it just didn't really it didn't really seem right for him and he wanted to leave on, on his terms. Um he felt when he couldn't take the team further, he would say that and step aside. And I suppose he he's been true to that really. Um I don't think fans were particularly sad to see him leave as such. I think they were frustrated with the timing, obviously, because it throws the whole pre season and summer out of the window in terms of preparations. But yeah, he just never after a point, so at first he did and North End fans took to him and he was saying a lot of the right things. But once he kept saying the same things and you didn't see much change on the pitch and the style of play wasn't amazing, fans aren't daft and they can see, you know, they can judge with their eyes that the football's not great. You don't need to come out and tell them that it is, uh, you know, they can see beyond that. So I think Ryan Lowe just like to talk a little bit too much where I think when you've got someone like Paul Heckingbottom who has kind of, you know, he's just a, a little bit old fashioned in the sense that he he's there to answer questions rather than get any sort of point across himself or trying to control the narrative. And I think that's been quite welcome for, for North End fans, really. Final question on Ryan Law, because of like what I was saying before and how it always felt like fractured without being like complete love hate. How will Preston fans look back on Ryan Times Low? Uh, Ryan Ryan Times Low. Ryan Low's <laughs> time as manager. Will it be looked back as kind of just a big giant waste of time? Because it kind of went nowhere without going too far down, too far up. Yeah, I think on the whole, you'll kind of reflect on Ryan's low kind of period as manager of of North End as something that happened. I don't yeah. think it was particularly. It wasn't particularly bad. Uh, obviously, it'd only be good if you kind of get into the playoffs. Um, a few times North End were close, 
uh, and failed to get in there and fell away, which again leaves such a sore taste in the mouth, uh, sour taste in the mouth, sorry. So that's always disappointing to be in and around it towards the end and then fail away, obviously, last season, finishing with uh, five defeats. I mean, North End are perennially mid-table, so he joined a team that were mid-table and finished mid-table. So it happened. Um, I don't think, you know, they wanted something different after Frankie McAvoy. They got something different. Um, he was young. He was, you know, seemed to seem was seen to be the right appointment at the time. He said the right things at the press conference about wanting to attack and all that sort of stuff. And I think almost the championship kind of wore him down a little bit. We saw it with Alex Neal towards the end where it became a bit more attritional and it came, you know, about trying to rescue results rather than building forward. And yeah, I don't think anyone particularly looks back at Ryan Lowe's appointment as a huge mistake or a costly mistake or anything like that. It's just another manager that's come into North End, not been able to get them promoted, not really been able to get them out of the table or see a playoff push through to the end. And then you move on to the next one who who gets a chance to try it. New man's Paul Heckenbottom. Uh, you know, he's linked to Sunderland in the summer and he's not like this was going to sound awful because I, I actually would derate him as a manager, but he's not the most glamorous. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because he's had a really mixed bag of a managerial career. I think he did really well with Sheffield United to get them back up. They weren't glamorous, but they were... Um, efficient he did really well with Barnsley when he first started he had two big jobs at two pressure clubs and firstly Leeds and then at Hibs where he he basically failed so he's had that mixed bag but how has his first few months been at Preston because this is like his I don't know if it is his fifth job but his fifth notable job where he probably needs to decide if he's going to be this good manager or or, or not yeah I, I think the jury's out still on Paul Heckenbottom in that he's picked up an interesting situation. I don't think there's enough really to judge Paul Heckenbottom on when obviously these aren't his players. Uh, They can't necessarily fit to a system that he'd necessarily want to play. I think he'd like, in an ideal world, probably to play four at the back and this squad doesn't really lend itself to that. Um, He's a proper football man, uh, which I think has appealed to a lot of North End fans. Um, As you mentioned, he knows what it takes to get out of this division. Obviously, he took over... Sheffield United, who were right in the bottom half of the table and managed to almost get them promoted his first season, get them promoted his second season. You know, North End fans would kill to have a season in the Premier League. However it goes, it's still, you know, a lot of money into the club. So, yeah, there's 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 been a good reception to him, I think, on the whole. Um, a few pretty drab results thrown in there, you know, similar to... The, the really heavy defeats that we had under under Ryan Lowe that were really difficult to watch and difficult to take. But at this point, it's not his players. Uh, Ryan Lowe had changed around pretty much the whole squad during his time. It's not Paul Heckenbottom's players. He had a few days, if that, to, to get players in at the end of the transfer window. So he's n- not really had chance to try and mould anything to what he wants. So it's just a case of him trying to do the best with what he's got. And I think Northam fans, to a point, are, are pretty sympathetic with him for that. It's funny you mentioned that about it not being his team and we're in November now. So like we're approaching that halfway stage sort of, although Christmas is, of course, really busy. But Preston just have been in football purgatory for a while. Like I remember going to your place um, when we went through nil and got in the playoffs and like it was the team that we wanted to play because you were 10th and you couldn't do anything. And we thought they've not really got anything to play for. Like we need a win of some sort as it was. We went there and... I mean, it was a really poor performance from Preston, as good as it was for us. But it feels like Preston have just been sat in that place since Alex Neal got you in seventh, which was nine a, a decade ago. Currently speaking, you're, you're 20th and you're just two points off the relegation places. So it's probably slightly different the moment to go the other way around. But there is an, an element of like last season, we finished 16th and it was one of the most boring second halves of the season I've ever had. And I would never really want to live through that again when games from March mean nothing pretty much um, Preston seem to go through that every single season this season might be a bit different where you know you're just two points off the relegation places it's a new manager with as you said before players that are not his how much is this season going to be just a case of you know making sure you stay up and stay clear of that relegation spot and then just build in from there yeah I mean it's strange because I think every season starts that way I think that the, the prime objective really for North End first and foremost is make sure you stay up and that's not really often thought about because North End have such a squad in that you can almost guarantee most seasons they're going to be better than three teams in this league and I think 
that is the same thing again this year. I don't think there's any real concern of them getting relegated. Um, as soon as you see some of the performances under Paul Heckingbottom and the kind of start that he had, um, you kind of got a sense that we're going to be okay. Um, in terms of it being a dead rubber season, again, it's kind of unfortunately, it's kind of what North End fans are used to in a sense. They want something to be able to get excited about. They want to be able to, you know, look forward to something and have that bit of hope. But it's kind of been dashed because of the start to the season, which is a horrible situation to be in that one game in, the whole season is derailed. It'll take some sort of miracle for Paul Heckenbottom to get them into contention. It's not, you know, it's not like it's never been done. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is a general sense of concern over relegation. Um, again, I'd be amazed if there isn't three teams worse than the North End this season, especially once you know Paul Heckenbaum really gets his feet under the table, um, maybe gets a few bodies back, and maybe gets to do a little bit in in January as well. Yeah, I, I won't lie to you. I'd be flabbergasted if, if Preston were amongst the the bottom, but you just never know with the championship. Um, it feels like a question I ask an awful lot because it's probably quite an interesting one when it looks at you know clubs' outlook and, and fans' expectation. But what is Preston's idea of success this season? Um, we know what Preston's would be in, in the long term because you've been close enough to the playoffs. I mean, there was a point last season when you were top for a few weeks and you were like, mm-hmm. oh, hang on a minute, Preston's, you never know. And then it just fell apart. But what would success be this season? Um, I think, in my opinion, I think mid-table success because of the way the season started, because I think mm-hmm. at the moment with injuries and things like that, the disruption... Um, and a new manager coming in, trying to get his new style in. You know, he plays a bit more on the front foot. He's a bit more proactive in in the press and things like that. I think as long as you can see there's foundations there to build on for next season, as long as there's, you know, North End, to be fair, this summer we're willing to give it a go. Um, unfortunately, those transfers were made for a different manager. Um, but if North End can go into the se- into kind of the end of the season with a bit of hope and a bit of, you know, some foundations to build on, a platform to give fans reason to think that Paul Heckingbottom could be the man to get them promoted, then I think that's a successful season because largely no fault of their own. Uh, I mean, you could argue they could have done it sooner with Ryan Lowe and and actually sacked him themselves and taken the decision out of his hands, um, given that the the chairman described it as an unacceptable end to the season. Um, They could have made that decision themselves in the end, he leaves after a game. It's not really their fault. It's a difficult situation to be in and it, it derails the whole season. So as long as you can find some sort of stability, uh, some sort of foundation that Paul Heckenbottom can then build on and the club can build on. And I think as well, getting players tied down because there's a lot of out-of-contract players. The club, again, feels like in a situation of flux. So if they can kind of get that stability in there, which Paul Heckenbottom, you would feel like, is a good man to be able to do that. Um, then you would see it as a bit of a success this season in the terms of building for next season. It's not necessarily that you're going to get some success this season, but a successful season would mean that you can have success later down the line. One of the, the most interesting aspects of your team from a Sunderland perspective, most definitely, is the fact you've signed Sam Greenwood alone, who mm-hmm. was incredibly highly rated. I think he's done certain things for, for Middlesbrough when he was at Leeds where you, you can kind of understand why he's so highly rated, but he's not quite hit that Premier League level young talent and he's in his early 20s. But then again, he came up at the Stadium of Light last year and scored against us for Middlesbrough, which we remember. Um, he's already got three goals in 10 games. He's more of an attacking midfielder than a centre forward, so it's good numbers. What have Preston fans made of his, uh, his impact so far? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one. I think, I mean, personally, I think there's a player in there. I think when you, yeah, yeah. you see him on the ball and the way he wants to drop a shoulder and his, his technique, there's there's certainly a player in there. It's not, he's not the type of player that North End get particularly often either. I think he's been pretty warmly welcomed. You can see that he wants to he wants to do something and he just needs kind of needs a system to suit him a little bit as well. It wouldn't have happened really under under Ryan Lowe. Paul Heckenbottom was getting a little bit more of a tune out of him, so to with uh, Mass Frockyar um, and you've got these sort of more interesting, more attack minded players, you know getting going, I mean Sam Greenwood has scored a couple of free kicks which is great because North End have not scored free kicks historically for quite a long while, not really since Paul Gallagher uh, which is quite a little while ago now and yeah, I think he's been pretty warmly welcome really, um, I think North End fans would be more than happy to see him 
sign on permanently, whether that's possible or not, we don't know. Um, but yeah, he had the unfortunate task of leading the line against Arsenal, which isn't really his game, um, especially not against the likes of William Saliba. Um, <laughs> but he's such a willing runner, puts himself about. Um, yeah, and he's had a really good start, to be fair. In terms of the summer itself, like I looked through your squad and a lot of the names I just recognised from previous seasons. And then I thought, mm-hmm. right, who they brought in? It, it was a really quiet summer. You've sort of touched on a little bit as to why it was maybe not successful or hasn't been as successful so far because the manager changed after a game unexpectedly. Um, but from what I can see, it's two players that came in permanently, three that came in on loan. Uh, my numbers might not be 100% right with that, which is quite small for a championship club. Um yeah, who's been the most impressive and, and outside of the players that have been there you know, longer than this season, who else is standing out for yourselves at the moment? Yeah, Kane Kessel-Hayden, I think, has been the, the standout of the of the new bunch. Th- uh, Stefan Thodarsson looked quite bright early doors, gone off the boil a little bit lately again. Sam Greenwood, similar, he's, he's looked very bright in, in, in patches. Yep, Jokul's is a strange one where he was certainly brought in... Well, he was brought in after... Paul Heckenbottom joined, but it wasn't his signing as such. Mm. So it's just trying to kind of find him a place and and get him up and running a little bit. Um, but yeah, Kane Kessler Hayden for me has been an absolute standout. He runs himself into the ground. He's kind of a, a complete fullback, really. He's not easy to get past. He's a good defender, great going forward, really likes to contribute, times runs well. Um, I think he's been brilliant. Mass Frockyar has looked a change man since Paul Hecking Bottoms come in. Genuine quality on the ball. Glides with it. Looks like he's got loads of time. Um, able to pick a pass. He's added a bit more of industry to his game. Getting himself about a bit more willing to put in tackles. Um, yeah, so it's, it's those sorts of players really that are kind of standing out. Obviously, you mentioned Sam Greenwell. Robbie Brady was in good form prior to his injury as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one really because Northern haven't had an amazing season so far and I've also not really had a lot of consistency in selection you've got Militan Osmajic that scores a few goals and then gets himself banned for you know nearly a dozen Ah. games Uh, so (laughs) yeah it's not been the easiest of times I forgot about that guy biting yeah was it Owen Beck that he bit yeah against Blackman you know benefit Suarez's career he got better after the bite so you never know (laughs) when he's back from suspension Um, it's funny because we've chatted throughout the three seasons that something had been up and we actually chatted if anyone remembers when we were in league one because yep. you were covering Fleetwood at the time um so you've sort of seen maybe through my glasses kind of what something had been over the past three four years you've seen us go from like coming out of league one from the playoffs going to immediate like playoff contenders getting in on the last mm. day by a goal difference to basically a mid-table team that couldn't get a win full of the money to now leading the league by three points, five points before before Saturday. What have you made of Sunderland's progress this season? Because you, you've sort of seen us at every step. And I think not that, you know, we weren't expected to go down or be rock mid-table. I think we, we hoped for top eight, but we're we're clear at the top and, and in my opinion, deservedly so. But how has that looked from the, the outside looking in? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, going into this season, I thought it was kind of a, almost a coin flip for Sunderland. They were either going to have a similar season to last season where they get the appointment wrong and it doesn't click or all it would take is getting the appointment right and the squad of players that Sunderland have are capable of doing what they're doing at the moment. I thought similar when Tony Mowbray was in charge, I thought he did a really good job and was getting a lot out of the players and it was at the same time a pretty good squad. And then, so it's interesting because obviously, like you say, if I track it, if I track it back from the amount of times obviously we've spoken over the years, Sunderland were coming out of League One. Obviously, fantastic season. I thought Tony Moby did a great job. But Sunderland got a bit carried away in, you know, the grass isn't always greener type thing and moving on from him. It, it bit them in the bum a bit. Uh, they got the appointment wrong, all that sort of stuff. And then, to be fair, they took the time. Um, and you kind of got to praise it now in that they've got the right man, clearly, if they're now top of the league. So it's an interesting one in that, I think if they had just not got carried away, again, it's only from the outside looking in, so I'm no expert on it, but if they hadn't have got carried away in trying to go better than Mowbray when they were still doing pretty good at that time, this may have happened sooner. They may have finished in the playoffs last season. They had a good squad. You know, The quality of the squad has probably improved, but not drastically. I don't think the quality in the championship is amazing anyway. 
they had a good core. They just needed someone to kind of unlock the the key components and to to get players firing. Um, and yeah, I'm not surprised to see them at the top this season. I'm not surprised to see them up there. I think they've got fantastic players. Obviously, Alan Brown's gone there in the summer, so it's a bit of interest from North End. Um, yeah, they just seem to be doing it doing it right. They've kept that kind of obviously lost Jack Clark, but they've kept like a core of of good players. Joe Bellingham's a, obviously a good signing. Things like that as they've gone along and they've allowed, given that platform, obviously not going to be available, but given them that platform to, you know, develop and now you get the right guy in, you've got the squad, it all just kind of makes sense that you're going to be up there. I wanted to ask you about Alan Brown because like he was there for nigh on a decade as far as I remember, mm-hmm. captained the team and Alan Brown was like a real positive sign-in in the summer because he was such a... Um, different signing to what we'd made we sign young players that are mm-hmm. under 24 we pay fee over the age of 24 we, we don't pay a fee but we very rarely signed them last summer we, we didn't sign them at all really I think if any I can't think of any at all apart from Bradley Dack which was like well anyway mm-hmm. um, whereas Alan Brown was like 29 and captained a team that had been predominantly like in and around the playoffs for most of the season before following X, Y and Z but international footballer Started the first game, really, really good, really, really good player. He's kind of came out the team because of how good Chris Rigg has been. He got injured after the the first game and then he had to be replaced by Chris Rigg and Chris Rigg's been, well, Chris Rigg. But he's came in, scored some really bizarre goals. You'll have seen the Meslier mm-hmm. goal. Um, he also scored a really bizarre goal at, at Portsmouth. But he's made a real big impression that Sunderland, even though he's done many, well, before most of his games on the bench, he'll play tomorrow night because he played on Saturday, Job's, um, suspended for the Wednesday night game. Are you surprised at how much Sunderland fans have enjoyed Alan Brown because you watched him for season after season? And was that quite a, a big loss for you? Yeah, massive, massive. I'm not at all surprised that that people have taken to him. I think he's a he's a really good. He's just a really good human. So he's a good guy. He's honest. He's hardworking. He's a good footballer. He's interesting in that he's a midfielder that likes to carry the ball. He's willing to take the ball on in pressure situations and, you know, ride a challenge and stuff like that, which is what fans want to see. They want to see that strength. They want to see the physicality. They want to see you trying to get the ball further up the pitch. And I think what's now useful for Alan Brown is that he can drive the ball 10 yards and lay it to someone else who's also willing to drive it 10 yards and drop a shoulder. And then it frees up room for him as well. Um I thought it was an interesting move in the, I mean, the main reason Alan Brown left was because Ryan Lowe was manager. Ironically, Hmm. that lasted a game and he could have stayed and signed on and he just didn't want to basically sign under that manager, not really seeing that he would always last longer than the manager anyway. Um, But North End's loss was Sunderland's gain. And I think it was an interesting move in that, as I mentioned earlier, on a coin flip, it could have looked like a, a bit of a sideways move in that, he could have gone from one mid-table championship club to another because that's where Sunderland finished last season and that's where you kind of judge them to a sense. Whether a sleeping giant and all this sort of stuff, as I mentioned earlier, the, the squad was there. It's just whether you know the powers that be were able to kind of get that going. As it's turned out, they have. And in the end, it looks like a, a brilliant move for him. He's now up at the top end of the championship table, able to challenge in a way that he's not really been able to do at North End. And he fully deserves that opportunity. He gave 10 great years of service to North End. Uh, he's a club legend. He was a fantastic captain, fantastic leader, led by example. Um, you know, he's, even simple things like he always made a point to make sure to go around to every corner of the ground to clap after a game. He was never one to rush off. He was always one to front up. He was he had the odd outburst, which is kind of what you want as a fan. You don't want mm-hmm. a robot. You don't want someone to say silent. You want to see a bit of personality and a bit of character. Um yeah, North End fans were, were gutted to see him go. They kind of knew the reason. Um, but after 10 years, regardless of the reason, you have to shake his hand and say, the very best of luck, thank you for your service. And that's kind of the situation with North End. Thankfully, Ali McCann has come in since and has been really good this season. Um, I mean, he was in a bit last season. It's not like he's a, a new player or anything. But the hole that Alan Brown has left behind has not really been felt as such so far this season. It doesn't really seem to feel like that's where the problem lies. There's no games where you're going, if only we had Alan Brown, but undoubtedly he'd increase the quality in uh, in the North End squad. Did you see his interview after the um, he scored against Leeds? <laughs> 
possibly yeah. the funniest post match I've ever seen. But uh, fair play, we, he did come up with the goods, and you know we should take yeah. the praise on that night. But uh, yeah. no, that, we... that's what he's like. You know, he's a bit, he's a bit tongue in cheek, and he's a bit, you know, he's not, he's not one to get overly carried away, and he's just like a norm, pretty normal guy, you know. And that's the sort of kind of it didn't surprise me when he came out with something like that because that's what Brownie's like. I feel like I've set this like second last question up before predictions by asking what I asked before, but maybe not. Um, if you could take any one player from Sunderland's team and place it in the Prestons, I'm not saying our best player, just who <laughs> would fit in your team, um, who would it be and, and why would it be? And you you can have Alan Brown if you really want. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you can't even get in your side. Should I go for Chris Riggs, who's replaced him? Um, no, it'd be some, something yeah. like that, I think, maybe. Um I think North End, it'd be nice to see North End having that sort of like, you know, like Rig or, or Bellingham or someone like that. Who, I mean, of course, Sunderland are going to have those players because, like you said, it's entirely their transfer strategy at the moment to sign young players up and coming that um, have sell on value. Um, North End at the moment in the squad, I mentioned earlier about getting players kind of tied down and things like that. There's not a lot of resale value in the squad. Um, but just to have someone exciting, I guess, Rig. Bellingham, someone like that, that that is signed to the club and and can, you know, give maybe hopefully inject a bit of cash in there too. <laughs> Prediction time. I'm I'm going on Wednesday because it's the easiest away day. Um, it's actually easier to get the Preston from Glasgow than it is to get to Sunderland. To be completely honest, <laughs> yeah. so it's a nice easy trip for me. Um, I have historically got an unbeaten run at Preston. I've seen us draw two two when McGeady scored. And I was there the three nil game, so I kind of have an awful icky feeling about it. But I'm I I can't bet against us. It's not really my shtick. Um, <laughs> so I'll say I'll say one one. Um, <laughs> but like I would like three points because I'd like to get promoted. Uh, I don't know why I hate the Premier League, but I'd like to get promoted. It'd be nice. Yeah, it'd be a nice bit of money, even if you did come down. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll also, I was also thinking 1-1, to be fair. I am actually in the posh pit uh, on Wednesday. It is Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah, yes. my dad's a season ticket holder in the uh, a bit of the posh pit in the Invincible, so it'll be to the left of the away uh, away fans. Uh, so I'll get a meal. Uh, I'll get a free programme, all that sort of stuff. Typical padded seat sort of thing. So I'll be there as well, enjoying it. And you'll get me giving um, you two fingers from yeah, behind. Yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ring me up, pick me out, and then just <laughs> flip the bird. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll go. I'll go score draw as well because I'm not. I'm not going to predict against North End, but at the moment I can't see them keeping a clean sheet, which is probably what's going to happen now. I've said it won't, but yeah, I'd like to think they can. They can nick a goal as well. Tom, always a pleasure to have you on, mate. I hope you have a horrendous uh, day on <laughs> Wednesday in your posh seats, mate. But uh, wish you luck for the rest of the season after that. No problem at all. Anytime. <laughs>